There once was a tavern that was being built in a small town that had previously been dry. No bars existed. And in opposition to this, a group of Christians gathered together and formed an all-night prayer meeting praying for God would intervene. Well, as it would happen, lightning struck the tavern and burned it down to the ground. The tavern owner, he's upset. He files a lawsuit against the Christians claiming they're responsible for the demise of his building. The Christians, they hire an attorney to defend themselves. They deny being responsible. Well, the judge who was presiding over the trial, he says, one thing is certainly clear no matter how this case turns out. The tavern owner believes in the power of prayer and the Christians do not. This morning, do you believe God can do anything? Even burn down a tavern? Not that we pray for that, okay? You don't pray for that. But how many believe God can do anything? Do we approach life with that faith of saying, God, I believe that nothing is too difficult. All things are possible with you. This morning, we're continuing our series on faith. And today we're going to be focusing on all things are possible. I want to welcome everyone here in the house. It's good to have you. Those that are with us for the first time, thank you for being with us. We say that you're only a guest one time. After that, you're part of the family. We pray that you feel welcomed and part of the family here, that you could become part and grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I also want to welcome our online audience that are with us today. Thank you for being with us. And this morning... As we look at faith, we've talked about how important faith is. The reason it's important is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so it just stands to reason that the better I understand faith, then the better I can please God. The better I understand it, the better I can please God and walk in a relationship with Him. And so we're looking at faith, and last week we we talked about how we're looking at faith as an acrostic, F-A-I-T-H, faith. And the letter F in faith stood for, yeah, you can cheat, you can look up on the screen, okay? Friendship, a friendship that is built on trust in the other person. And God wants you and I to build a friendship with Him that's based on trust. Really, all relationships are based on trust. The more you trust someone, the closer you will get to them. But if you don't trust them, you're going to hold them at arm's length. You don't want to develop a closeness because they're untrustworthy. Abraham was called a friend of God because he believed in God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So last week we talked about that the goal of our faith is that faith has always been about entering a relationship with God and about God entering a relationship with us. God wants a relationship with you. Do you realize that? He wants a friendship with you. He wants to be your very best friend. That's the foundation of faith is a friendship with God. Today we're going to look at the letter A. And the letter A, this is what this this tells us about faith, is that all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 it says O Lord God behold you yourself have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm nothing is too difficult for you I want you to say that with me nothing is too difficult for God nothing's too difficult for him 57 times in the Bible it says It calls God Almighty. You know what that means? He has all might. He has all power. Because He has all might, He has all power, nothing is too difficult for Him. Five times it says nothing is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. One of those times is in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, a verse you might hear a lot in about two and a half months from now when it's Christmas season, the angel appeared to Mary and says, hey, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. You're going to call His name Jesus 
And she says, how is this going to happen? Yeah, I haven't known a man. I haven't engaged in that. And the angel says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing is impossible. Not even burning down taverns. What can you dream of that you need God to do in your life? God can do it. I propose God can do anything you need Him to do this morning. God, He paid for taxes by giving a guy a fishing pole and says, go catch a fish and you'll open the fish's mouth, you'll find money in it, and it'll pay for your taxes. How many wish that would happen for your IRS bill this year? Just go down to the Platte River and boom, you know, you've got this check. Boom, I, I've got, I can pay for my taxes. That's what God can do. What can God do? He can cause a jar of oil and a bit of flour to, go, to last month after month after month in a famine that lasts for three and a half years. That's what God did for a, wi- a widow woman and her son. God can do anything. What can God do? God parted the Red Sea. So that Israel goes through on dry ground, not mushy ground, it's dry ground. And then when Pharaoh and the chariots of Egypt and all the soldiers come in, the wheels fall off the chariots, the ground gets mucky, the sea closes up, and their enemy is destroyed, and they don't ever have to worry about Egypt coming after them again. That's what God can do. When those same Egyptians are out of food, God provides manna for them, bread from heaven for 40 years. When they're out of water, God brings a river of water from a rock that gives them water for 3 million people. In the desert. Now think about that. Where do you find a water supply to water 3 million people in the desert? That's what our God can do. Our God can close the mouths of lions like he did for Daniel. Our God can do what he did for Esther and the Jews when the enemy wanted to destroy the whole nation of Israel. God turned the tables and the Jews were able to destroy all their enemies. God can do anything you need him to do. God caused an axe head to rise up out of a river and float. You see, it's not just the big things But even a little thing like when you lose an axe head and you don't know how to pay for it, God cares about the big and the little. He does the miraculous. We're told in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 36, the angel of the Lord went out and he killed the camp of the Assyrians. The Assyrians were a nation that was surrounded the nation of Israel. They were in the city of Jerusalem. They were going to destroy them. But the angel of the Lord came and 185,000 soldiers were killed. And when the people rose in the morning, their corpses were all dead. Friends, you might feel outnumbered, but with God and you, you're a majority. God is never outnumbered. God is never outmanned. God is never under-resourced. God is never understaffed. Our God is a limitless God. Our God is a healer. You read in the Bible about time after time after time how God has healed people. And there have been millions, if not billions of people who have been healed in the Scriptures and throughout all of human history. And our God is so awesome, so powerful, He can even raise the dead. Nothing is too difficult with God. I think you stayed up too late last night. (laughs) Nothing is too difficult for God. With God, all things are possible. And you know what? We should just quit right there because that's a high note to finish on. We're done for the day. Oh, that feels so good. But there are some things we need to consider because if God can do everything, I'm going to throw this out here, if God can do anything, can He make a rock that is too big for Him to lift up? Think about that. If God can do all things, he can, then He can make all things, so that means God can make a rock that's too big for Him to lift up. That doesn't make sense. I mean, so well, then God can't do everything. Here's the thing. We're going to learn some facts on faith today because, you see, some people take the thing that all things are possible with God 
They take it out of context and they distort what faith is. And if we don't understand what it really means, all things are possible with God, we can have a distorted view of faith. And then when things don't go the way we think they should, we lose faith. And I've seen time and time again where that happens. And it breaks the heart of God. It breaks my heart. I don't want a single one of you to lose faith. Because here's the thing. When you stop trusting God, when God doesn't do what you want Him to do and you stop trusting Him, you've lost faith. And if you lose faith, you can lose relationship and you can lose your salvation. So I want to take you on a little journey as we unpack three facts about faith and that all things are possible. In your notes this morning, they're on the back of your worship program. They're also on the Radius Church app. The first fact about faith is that faith's results can be immediate or they can happen through a process. Faith results, the results that come from our faith, they can be immediate or they can happen through a process. Sometimes when we pray, God answers instantaneously. Bam! It's right away, straight away, without delay. Pronto, boom. We pray, God answers. Now, honestly, that's how I like God to answer. I mean, I think we all, you know, why wait? I mean, that's no, where's the fun in waiting? I mean, I want it now. It's kind of like that old song, I want it all, I want it all, and I want it now. You know, that's a lot of times how we approach faith. Because that's what gets noticed. That's what gets the attention. That's what gets the applause. That's what gets written about in the magazine. And might even get put on the TV news at least on YouTube. But faith isn't, the results of it is not always immediate. Sometimes it goes through a process. Many years ago, I had anger issues and they were so bad, my wife said, you've got to do something about it. I can't stand it anymore. I can't handle this anymore. You've got to go get counseling. You've got to take care of this. So I did. I went and saw a counselor and There were several steps he walked me through, but there was one thing in the process that God guided me to do, and that was to read the whole New Testament through, looking for this this one kind of grain, this one um, stream, this one thread, and that is, how does God feel about Christians? Because here's the thing. I knew that God loved me, but I felt he really didn't like me. I felt like I was the black sheep of God's family, and that... He just endured me, and then he was always giving me the short end of the stick. And that was part of what was producing the anger in my life. And so here's the thing. If I can discover how God feels about all believers, and I'm a believer, then that means that's the way God feels about me. And I felt like God directed me to start in the book of Romans, and I read that when I came to verse 6, it was the first verse that really popped out at me. And what I did is I started writing every verse down, But verse 6 says, you are the called of Jesus Christ. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, Craig, look at this. I called you. You didn't call me. You didn't reach out to me. I was reaching out to you. I initiated the relationship. It's not that I just endure you. I want you. And it was like, I read that. It was just like, that. wow, God really wants me. He does like me. And I began to read through the whole New Testament, writing down, I don't know how many verses, and all the verses that, and when I finished, it was like there were certain ones that kind of popped out that meant more to me. And so I recorded them. I typed them all up on a sheet of paper, 49 verses, all right? And I would read those verses every single day in my devotions. I read them and I prayed those verses over me. And in time, it changed my identity. Instead of me getting my worth from what I accomplished or what other people thought of me, I began to get my identity from who God said I was. It was a process that took several months. I wish I had prayed, God, take my anger away. I wish it was instantaneous, but it wasn't. 
It had to go through a process, a series of events that God was refining my faith with. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Two words. If you've got a, 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 a hard copy Bible, I want you to circle these two words. If you don't, just write them in your notes, okay? The first word is renewing, okay? talks about renewing your mind. It's a continuous process. It's not... I renew it and I'm one and done. No, it goes on and on and on, kind of like the Energizer Bunny. It just keeps going and going and going. It's renewing. The other word I want you to circle or write down is prove. Prove. This uh, commonly applied to metals, and it was the operation of testing or trying metals by fire. They would heat them up to see if there was any impurity, and if the, the impurities would rise to the top as the heavy metal went down, and they would skim it off. And so that's the word there. And what God is saying, if you want to see if you're in the pure will of God, how many want to live in the will of God? You want to find, almost everyone here, you want to find God's will. Well, the key to proving what God's will is your life, to discern if you're really walking in everything God has for you, is the constant process of renewing your mind. Don't be conformed to the pattern of the world. Renew your mind and prove the good, perfect will of God. You see, faith's results many times are a process God wants to take us through. It's a process He wants to take us through. The most important result, and this is in your notes this morning, the most important result of faith is that God's greatest goal for your faith is not to answer your prayers. Ouch. His ultimate goal is to conform you to the image of Christ, not conform himself to your image, the image that you want. That is the ultimate goal of faith for you and me to be like Jesus. And so when I'm praying for something, God's asking myself, if I give Craig this, is this going to make him more like me or is this going to make him less like me? You see, I just can't ask for anything I want. I mean, I can't ask for anything I want, but that doesn't mean God will give it to me because God wants that friendship with me. And if he gives something to me that's going to cause me to not love him as much, that I'll love that thing or love something else or someone else more, then what God is going to do is he, he knows what I need. He is superior. He knows everything. Sometimes people who talk about faith, you can very easily focus on greed and comfort and pleasure instead of being conformed to the image of Christ. And when you look at 1 Peter chapter 6, verse 9, it talks about really the goal of faith. What is the end of our faith, the goal of our faith? It says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Does that sound like fun? Suffering grief and all kinds of trials? No. God, why didn't you deliver me? Why didn't you answer my prayer? Why didn't you help me? But he says, you're greatly rejoicing in it. Why? These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, it's that picture of Romans proving the acceptable will of God. That's the picture Peter's painting there. It says, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. There's that friendship aspect of faith we talked about. You love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Now make sure you catch this last part here. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. Some, of, some translations say the goal of your faith. What is that goal? What's the end result? The salvation of of your souls. Faith is not about getting what we want. Faith is about the salvation of our souls and becoming like Christ to develop a greater friendship with Him. That's the ultimate goal of faith. And that's important to understand as we pray for God to do all things that 
he's working all things to be conformed to the image of Christ. Let's look at the second fact about faith, and that faith is linked to the character, promises, and the sovereignty of God. Our faith is linked, it's tied, it's bound to the character, the promises, and the sovereignty of God. You can't separate faith from those aspects. Sometimes people want God to do things for them that do not align with who God is. They do not align with His ways, with His principles and His plans. I want you to write these three words down. I didn't put these in your notes, but write down God's will, all right? God's word, and God's timing. Write those three things down. God's will, God's word, God's timing. Don't ask God to give, some, give you something or do something for you that's against his will. Don't do that. Don't ask God to do something that goes against his word. And then don't be disappointed when God doesn't act on your timing, but he acts on his timing. God's will, God's word, and God's timing. These are things that need to be taken into consideration when we're praying for God to do all things in our life, to deliver me from anger or alcohol or drugs, to heal my body of cancer or of MS or whatever I might be struggling with, for God to provide a job for me, for God to give me a raise, for God to save my kids, for God to save my parents. Whatever you need, those are things that we need to keep in mind as we're praying about it. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God talking. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This past week, my wife and I, we were sitting on our porch, um, just enjoying the night. It was dark outside. We're enjoying the night. It was a beautiful night. We realized we're not going to have too many more nights like this. And all of a sudden, up in the heavens, we see this string of lights, and they're moving in the heavens in a straight line. It was freaky. Turned out to be Elon Musk Starlink, you know, but at first it's like, UFOs are being invaded. They're from outer space. They're from the heavens, from the farthest reaches of the earth. Okay, we don't believe, I don't believe in UFOs, Okay. The only flying saucers are like when you, you get mad at your spouse and wham, you know, you fly the saucer, you know. <laughs> but way out in the heavens, God says, that's how far my thoughts are above your thoughts. In other words, you can't comprehend my thoughts. You don't know my plans. You might think you know my plans. You might think you know what's right. But man, my ways are so much higher than your ways. And so when God doesn't work according to the way we think he should, that's when we need to trust in the character of God. We sang about this morning, God is so good. I, the goodness of God. I'm going to trust his character. I'm going to trust his promises that say, I will never leave you nor forsake you, even when the bottom falls out of your life. I'm going to trust in the sovereignty of God that God is superior and He knows what's best for my friendship, my relationship with Him. When we say God can do all things, it doesn't mean He will do all things. When I was in high school, there were some bullies who made my life miserable. And I prayed, I, I prayed, I, I hated them, okay? And, and I went Old Testament. I said, God... Open the ground and swallow them up. I went James and John on them. Lord, send fire from heaven. God did answer that prayer. You know why? Because it went against his character. You see, God is loving and compassionate and merciful, extending mercy to thousands of generations. He is long-suffering, not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to everlasting life. And so God did not answer that prayer. I mentioned earlier there's five times in the Bible when it says, with God all things are possible. One of those is Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Jesus said it. 
And Christ said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not I will, but what you will. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane just hours before they crucify him, driving nails in his hands and his feet. And he knew he was going to be crucified because there was a prophecy in Isaiah 53. It says, they pierced my hands and my feet. He knew he was going to be crucified. Crucifixion was a torturous, grueling, long, hours, hours, hours long process of death. Jesus knew that was coming, but he even knew something was worse. He was going to be separated from God, forsaken by God, as he bore our sin. He experienced our punishment, and he's he's praying, God, I know all things are possible. You can deliver me from this. I don't want to go through this suffering. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus is our example, and I just want to pause right here before we go on. I want everyone here and those who are watching online to realize that God loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus to die on the cross, and Jesus wasn't forced into dying for your sins. He says, I willingly lay my life down. That's what he did. Do you realize when he's on the cross, he could have called six legions of angels, or 12 legions of angels, 72,000 angels he could have called to come and rescue himself. But he stayed on the cross because he loves us. And the thing is, is God wants each of us to have this relationship with him. But our sin separates us from a relationship and that's why Christ died so that we can be forgiven of our sin and give God the leadership of our life and say, God, you're sovereign. I'm going to trust you no matter what happens with my life. You're Lord. I'm confessing you as Lord. You're the boss. And what I want to do right now is I just want to pause. I know we usually do this at the end of the service, but I want to just pause right now. Everyone bow your heads, close your eyes. And there may be some of you here today, you don't have a relationship with God. And maybe you feel like God has given you the short end of the stick. Maybe you feel like God's been mean. You've pray, maybe you've even prayed and says, God, help me. And he hasn't answered your prayer. And you've become bitter at God. You've turned your back on him. Maybe you were following him at one time and you've turned away. Whether you're here in, in the house or online, if God's talking to you today and you'd say, I need to be forgiven of my sin. I need to trust God with my life. I want to surrender my life to him and say, Jesus, you're Lord, you're King, you're sovereign, you're in charge. If that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand? Just put it up high. Thank you, I see that hand. Anyone else this morning? Anyone else? Thank you, I see that hand there in the middle. Anyone else? You'd say, that's me, Craig. I want a relationship with God. I need to be forgiven. Thank you, I see that hand. If you're watching us online today and God's speaking to your heart, you feel him drawing you, I just want you wherever you're at, just put your hand up in the air and say, God, here I am. I want to be your friend. I'm trusting you with my life. I'm giving you control. Anyone else in the house today, you'd say, that's me. I want to give God control of my life. Thank you. I see that hand. I'm going to say this prayer. I'd like each person to repeat this after me. Lord God, I have sinned against you. Forgive all my sin. Wash away all the filth. Change my life as I surrender to you. Lead me and guide me. I place you in charge. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me and dying for my sin. I commit myself to you. Amen. You know, the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God can do all things. He can cleanse you from all things, all sin. He saves you to the uttermost, the deepest, darkest thing. It's been washed away. He's chosen not to remember it anymore. God has forgiven you. 
Can we celebrate with those who've received the forgiveness and the love of God this morning? Amen. Those of you who've done that, I'd like you to do two things when we're wrapping church up today. One, in the seat in front of you, there is a card that says welcome. And halfway down, there's a box that says, I received Christ today. Just check that box and then fill out the top part of the card. And then you can go to the welcome table. It's a, it's a high top black table with the welcome banner by it. And we've got a free gift for you. It's a book that will help you grow in a relationship with Jesus. That's the first thing. The second thing is next Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, we have a class right in our library. It's called Growth Tracks. And you can grow. It's, we teach you four basic things that will help you start growing in a relationship with Jesus. So, and the, the library, you walk in the front doors, take a hard right, and it's right there. We invite you to be part of that. Amen. Amen. Welcome to God's family. It's yeah. good to ha have you. Hallelujah. All right. I want to look at the final fact about faith this morning. And the final fact is that faith receives what God gives. Faith receives what God gives. We see that attitude in the book of Daniel when King Nebuchadnezzar, he invaded the nation of Israel and took thousands of Jewish young men back to Babylon. Three of those were um, Rack, Shack, and Benny, if you're a VeggieTales fan. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their biblical names. And what took place is they are there. Nebuchadnezzar builds this 90-foot-tall statue of gold of himself, and he commands everyone to bow down and worship the statue. Rakshak and Benny says, no way, we, we follow God. Nebuchadnezzar, he calls, and they were some of his trusted advisors, top men in the kingdom. And he says, hey guys, I'm going to give you a second chance. You, you probably didn't understand what I meant. Just bow down to the idol and everything's good, all right? And they say, no. I want you to take a look in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand. What are they saying? All things are possible with God. He can deliver us. Verse 18, But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Friends, their attitude was, God, if you give us deliverance, we receive it. But if you give us death, we receive that. They're trusting in the sovereignty of God. They're standing on the character of God, knowing that He's God Almighty. He is able to deliver us. Yes. And they've got faith. He will. But they're also acknowledging God is sovereign. But if not, if He decides He's going to receive more glory, it's a greater testament to the people that, man, they were willing to die and they gave their life for God. If that's going to do more work for the kingdom then we receive that too. What's your level of faith? When God doesn't give you what you want, do you receive what He gives you? Or do you say, oh, how can you do that to me, God? I've been serving you. You know what I do for you, God? How I pray, how I'm faithful, I'm loyal, I tithe, I give the missions, I serve here, I serve there. God, why don't you do this for What have I ever done to you? I'll tell you what you've done to Him. It's what we've all done to Him. We put His Son on the cross. I have no business to boss God around and tell Him what He needs to do. Because... He is Lord. And if I'm bossing Him around, that means I've switched up lordship and I've made myself Lord. Faith receives what God gives. I'm going to give you an example of these three facts working together and, and then we'll wrap this up. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about having visions and revelations of God. And Bible theologians almost all agree Paul's talking about himself when he says, I know of a man 
who 14 years ago was caught up in the heavens, whether he was in his body and he was physically taken there or it was an out-of-body experience, I don't know. Theologians agree Paul's talking about himself in the third person. How many of you ever do that? You talk about yourself in the third person. Yeah, we, we do that sometimes. Anyway, it goes on to say and, and in verse 6, Even if I should choose to boast... I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I say or do. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Have you ever had a thorn in your flesh? A rose bush? or a stick or a bramble, and it sticks in there. Not, not a pleasant experience. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. We see right here the fact, number one, that faith results can be immediate or they can be a process, and that the most important result is conforming to Christ's image. Paul is praying, God, take this away from me. And what does it say here? Lest I become conceited, lest I become proud, and I become arrogant. Man, look what God has showed me. Woo, am I spiritual. I know all this stuff. He says, I saw things that I can't even tell you about them. God has forbidden me. They're inexpressible. And God was so concerned about Paul's character it was like, Paul, so that you stay humble, I'm giving you this thorn in the flesh. It's a messenger of Satan, a demonic attack. And he says, I pleaded three times. And what took place in verse, in verse 12, it says, by grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Some people think that this thorn in the flesh that Paul had was a physical eye problem. They get that from Galatians chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. Paul says, It was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself coming down from heaven and visiting you. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn your eyes out and given them to me. People think that Paul was having problems with his eyesight and that they said, I'll tear our eyes out, we'll give it to you. And that the thorn in the flesh was this physical problem. We don't know if that's what it is. But if that's what it was, it's, it's just an interesting thought. And I'll kind of tie that in in just a moment. But here's the thing. When Paul says... God said to me, my grace is sufficient. That's linked to, fa uh, to number two, that faith is linked to the character, promises, and sovereignty of God. Paul realizes God is sovereign here. Even though I'm pleading three times, God says, no, Paul, you need to go through this. But what about the promise that says, no weapon formed against you will prosper? Isn't that a promise of God? What about the promise in 1 John 4, 4 that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world so he should be able to overcome this messenger of Satan? Or what about if it was the eyesight, the promise in Psalm 103, verse 3 that says, God heals all our diseases. You see, there are times when you can quote a promise of God, but it conflicts with the sovereignty of God. And when it does then you trust Him. Because faith never loses trust. Faith always keeps believing. Because when you stop believing, you've lost faith. The third fact about faith we see in here is found in the second half of verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. What kind of power did he have? He took the gospel to the Gentiles. People have figured out when you track his missionary journeys, he traveled 10,000 miles by foot and by ship, taking the gospel 
planting 14 churches in three nations that are today Syria, Greece, Turkey, and numerous regions you can't even find on a modern-day map. On top of that, he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, almost half of the books of the New Testament, Paul wrote. That's the power of Christ that he had. How did he get that power? He says, that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. How do you think Paul's off his rocker there? I delight in these things. Woohoo! What was he smoking? Did he go to Colorado or something? He's delighting in this stuff? No, he didn't go to Colorado. He says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul received what God gave him. The insults, the persecutions, the hardships, the trials, the thorns in the flesh. He received what God gave him. This morning, we're going to pray and believe for God to do all things for you. And I'm praying for miracles to happen, for you to be healed, for you to be delivered. But you know what my prayer has been even more? That every person here and every person watching online, you would say, God, the greatest goal of my faith is my salvation, my relationship with you, and I'm not going to let anything shake that. Because if you gain everything you pray for, but you lose your soul, you've lost everything. You've gained nothing. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace that you purchased for us by dying on the cross for our sin. You didn't want to suffer. It was possible for you to avoid the suffering, but you surrendered your will to the Father. Jesus, help us to do the same, to rely on your grace to carry us through anything that life throws at us. Ephesians 6.16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you're able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. How many of the darts? What does it say? All the darts. All the darts of the enemy. You know what God sometimes does, though? Those darts that are quenched, he allows them to stay and to be thorns in us because for some reason they'll conform us more to the image of Jesus. This morning, how many of you would say, I want to serve God no matter what happens. No matter if he answers my prayer or if he doesn't. But you're just saying, I want a greater friendship. I don't want anything to stand in the way between me and God. I want to be like Jesus. If that's the most important thing, I want you just to raise your hand this morning. If that's you, just make that commitment. God, here I am. God, I'm giving everything to you today. Thank you. I see those hands. That's awesome. Lord Jesus, I pray right now, God, that we would surrender our will. And Lord, this is a, a, a continuous commitment. We're renewing our minds because, God, there'll come a time when we are have a fiery dart that hits us. And the enemy is going to tell us, God doesn't love you. He's not good. He's not there for you. And we'll be tempted to abandon our faith tempted to walk away, tempted to please ourselves to try to make what we want come about instead of laying our life down and trusting you. I pray today for every person here, God, that you would give us a faith that is solid, that is strong, that is founded upon a friendship with you and the goodness of God, and that we have a home in heaven with you forever. The salvation of our souls, the end result of our faith. And Father, I pray right now, that as we come to a time of asking you to do all things, to do miracles, that you would do that. Lord, let faith arise. And if there's any unbelief, help our unbelief. As you said to the man who says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, do miracles this morning. Amen.